My name is Jeff Melanson. Delighted to be here. I'm going to share some thoughts with you on arts and culture, my experiences in Toronto, and also within some large institutional context. I'll give you a little bit of a sneak peek about what's happening next at the BAM Center. Just by show of hands, how many of you have been to the BAM Center before? That's what I'm talking about. Thank you. I was in Winnipeg last night. Response was not quite as uh, favorable. So in terms of assumptions, when we talk about creativity, this is something that does not often make me popular talking to arts people. But I will say, I think one of the th roles of the arts and culture sector is to awaken creative potential in everybody, and hopefully in an ideal world, to help everyone in our society identify themselves as creative or as having artistic potential and capacity. This is a great book by one of our leading authors at the BAM Center, Wade Davis. You probably know of Wade. He's one of the great sort of cultural anthropologists of our planet. Um, one of the shifts in focus that I think is really, really important for arts and culture is to move away from our seeing ourselves as a sort of an elite class of special people and towards really looking at awakening again, uh, reimagining that creative potential within every person. <clears throat> Some people in the arts community don't like that very much. I'm sorry if uh, you have that perspective, but I think it's really, really important that we look at that. And I would draw the correlation with the sports community here. I know people don't like that comparison either, but. If I were to ask a room of people how many athletes, how many runners we have in the room, you can be an avocational runner and identify yourself as a runner. If you ask the same thing to a room of people who are not artists, how many of you are artists? Most of them are kind of ashamed, they don't feel they're good enough. At some point a music teacher has told them they don't have a good voice and they should mouth the words. Um, there's usually trauma around arts and culture which there should not be. So I think part of our job as a sector is awakening that creative potential within everybody. A little bit on Toronto. So this is a slide. I get criticized as well. I get criticized for lots of things. This is kind of like a group therapy session for me all of a sudden. It's fantastic. Um, talking about money. So this is a chart that looks at the, at the total aggregated budgets for all of the arts and cultural institutions in Toronto from 1991 to 2009. So you see back in the 90s, the various different sources of funds were about the same. The purple line here is the average growth of the sector. By 2009, if you added up all 1,200 arts organizations' budgets, it was about a $300 million number. So that's the growth of the sector. The green line here is federal and provincial support. The red line is inflation, on average. The orange line at the bottom is municipal support for arts and culture. You can see that's not very good. And this blue line is private sector support. So you can see private sector support generally about twice the growth of the sector, and I think the skew up that we've seen in Toronto and other major markets really has been connecting with the private sector. So I raise that just because a lot of people are concerned about private sector and its involvement in arts and culture, and I would say if you're not sort of on this trajectory to some degree, your organization is probably suffering. So it's very, very important that the private sector steps up, and I think there's a real opportunity within Calgary to see much more private sector engagement in arts and culture. <coughs> I would also add that after this year, some of you will know that there, we have a mayor in Toronto that's a very large, round man named Rob Ford. One thing that Luke left out of my bio, thank you for that, was I did a year his, as his arts advisor before I moved here, which is why I look like I'm 60 and I'm 39 years old. <laughs> but I will tell you that Rob Ford and a very right-wing council in Toronto about a month ago, put in the largest municipal funding arts increase in the history of Canada. So that surprises people. They unanimously uh, supported a culture plan a year and a half ago. In Calgary, obviously, you have a very arts-friendly mayor. So I would just encourage those of you that are involved in the arts community, you have an arts-friendly mayor. If we were able to get a very arts-unfriendly mayor to support that kind of municipal funding increase, surely Calgary is ripe for a fairly significant increase as well. In terms of innovation, I was asked to speak recently at the opening of a consultancy practice in, uh, in Calgary, a very prominent one, and they asked me to talk about innovation. And I'm sure this is one of the buzzwords. Innovation and risk-taking seems to be what we're talking about constantly. And I was curious, whenever a sort of a business uh, association asks an arts leader to speak as a keynote at the opening of their office, you wonder sort of if they're uh, a little off or if they're very creative and dynamic. So I asked them why innovation, and they said to me, um, because we keep talking about it and none of us know what it means, which is a, probably a good way. So I thought, you know, let's, let's try to find a good definition. Oh, 
Should I do this? No, I'm not going to do that. Maybe I should do that. I'll, I'll jump back, sorry. So in terms of what is it, this is the def best definition I could find online. So uh, one of those very you know, solid, now you all know, go do it. Um, McKinsey, of course, also has a very, very long, verbose, about a four-page definition of innovation. So we at the BAM Center tossed out a new, sort of uh, simpler version. What we're trying to do with all of our language at the center is sort of demystify some of the sort of creative process and innovation. So we tried this, practical application of creativity. And what we're finding at the center is that opens us up to have a pretty interesting conversation around each of those three words in the definition. Practical, to what end, for whom? People in the business community, people in the arts community, increasingly are looking at how we define our constituencies and how we define success in a much more robust way. Application, what sort of approaches do we need to take to create a creative environment? What kind of uh, context do we have to set around complex problem solving that ensures there's a diversity of perspectives and so on? And creativity, fortunately at the BAM Center, I get to work with 4,000 artists per year, 13 different artistic disciplines, many, many different approaches to how we look at creativity, how we fuel it, how we develop it. So really, really important for us uh, within the broader business community to think about innovation and the role of arts and creativity in helping reimagine business processes, how we define our society, but also within the arts and culture sector to look a bit more dynamically about what we do. So that just summarizes that. In terms of some new business models that might be of interest, the Metropolitan Opera, how many of you have seen the Met in a theater near you? By a show of hands. Oh, not as many as I would have guessed. So the Metropolitan Opera has done a couple of really innovative things. Peter Gelb, their general director, who's a mentor and friend of mine, um, wanted to take this old stuffy institution and also make them very vital and relevant to people all over the world. Some of you will know they've been doing Texas, Texaco radio broadcasts for many years. So they launched, as a first step, this dynamic uh, intervention now that's in 60 countries where you now have the world's best opera company in your local communities, which has really, really provided some profound access to dynamic operatic content. The more disruptive change that they're putting forth is the Met Player. So the Met Player is the next iteration of their development where they're taking all of that opera and you can now download those operas into your home on any sort of device or on any mobile device as well. So you now have access to this world-class content, not only in Manhattan, but anywhere in the world. Pretty dynamic and something that's relevant as we think about cultural strategies going forward and global competitiveness. Some other models just worthy of looking at. Um, Arcade Fire, Arcade Fire fans. Yeah, good. So uh, they've been on campus recording. Um, little indie rock promo for the BAM Center for anyone who follows the arts and crafts record label, Broken Social Scene, Feist, Stars, Young Galaxy. All of their talent development will be housed at the BAM Center going forward, so it'll be kind of a fun place in terms of new content. Arguably, though, when you talk to the band, if they had not partnered with Google Earth to create this music video, I don't know how many of you have uh, actually gone online to participate in this process. They don't think they would have been nominated for a Grammy. The great work of Oren Levy, any Oren Levy, her morning elegance people, worth looking up. Early precursor to the Arcade Fire movement in terms of video content online and engagement. This obscure songwriter in Los Angeles created this music video, went viral, was nominated for a Grammy. We've got uh, Me Dancing, the crazy dance with this Danish rock band here. And yes, I can move like Jagger, just as the image would suggest. In the bottom right corner, one thing we have not adapted to in the arts and culture sector is the opportunities in social media. So I don't know if anyone in the room plays Farmville, just by show of hands. You can admit to it. We're all friends here. Nobody. Incredible. So thank you. Normally after I say that, I say, please don't ask me to plant a digital carrot in your garden. Farmville last year monetized $300 million of digital carrots. So that game generated $300 million of revenue. Why I raise that, when I was at the ballet school, we had a pretty interesting conversation going with Ryerson's Digital Media Zone, where we thought, could we not develop a similar game for all the young dancers, aspirational dancers from around the world, and have them give them each other point shoes or some such thing and uh, engage people in that way. So some new, new business models, new opportunities for arts and creativity. So I, before I get to the case study, I'm just gonna flash back through a few slides, this one. 
So this is a slide that uh, also is very popular with large cultural institutions. This is the work of Clay Christensen. Clay Christensen is a Harvard business prof who is the architect, the founder, the sort of key instigator of disruptive innovation theory. And what Clay talks about is why sectors change, how new ideas emerge and such. So what he's got in this slide, this is the, uh, he's much more eloquent than I am on this, but he's got this, um, this is the byproduct of about 40 years of research on his part. He has this dark blue line, which he calls an incumbent line. So an incumbent in the arts and culture context would be a large cultural institution that's old and established. The BAM Center would be one of these. And the point he makes about in, bus in business is you have incumbents, which are successful companies in a field, and they're run by smart people who know their audience very well and create sustaining innovations that make the product somewhat more accessible and somewhat more effective for that existing audience. Meanwhile, someone young and emerging usually creates an entirely new idea that does not work for that constituency base. But over time, that product uh, improves to the point where it hits this sort of utility line and everyone bails on the old product and jumps to the new. So I heard Clay do the talk on this a couple years ago down in Boston, and I wondered why that didn't apply to arts and culture. And the point I'd make is I think the reasons why is the big institutions like the BAM Center that are up here have a disproportionate access to government funding and private sector support. And a new institution starting today would not have access to those things. So one thing we do need to think about dynamically within our cultural sector is how do we ensure that the large platform institutions are effectively partnering with the new ideas to make sure the new generation of talent really has a profound voice and opportunity to develop. And I would say most of our large institutions, including the BAM Center, the National Ballet School, which I've run, were it not for seed capital in the 50s and 60s, we wouldn't be large institutions. So it really is incumbent on those of us running larger institutions in the sector to ensure that new voices are heard and developed. How am I doing time-wise here? Sign, are we doing okay? Ten minutes still, okay, I can go some more slowly. So any dancers in the room? All right, very good. So I ran the National Ballet School. I started when I was 33. I'd never danced before, so I took adult classes. And you can imagine when you're six foot six and 220 pounds, you're very graceful as a dancer. So after the presentations tonight, we'll have a few drinks and I can show you some of the moves. Uh, the ballet school was 50 years old or so when I started. It was insolvent as an institution. Um, we were bankrupt, basically. Um, $10 million operating budget when I started. From 2006 to 2011, we went from $10 million to $22 million through the recession. Um, we increased the endowment from $8 million to about $40 million per year, so developed it quite a lot. And what we wanted to do was a couple of things in terms of refining the focus. The first was we had a mission statement. So I don't know how many of you, I'm sure you all have a sense of what a mission statement is. What it should be is something concise, something that everyone knows that really gets people excited about where you're going. When I started, our mission statement was about six sentences long. And I met with all 230 staff of the ballet school and I said, how many of you know what the mission statement is? And on the bright side, um, well, sorry, nobody knew what it was. So on the bright side, I could change it. On the con side, it wasn't really, there was no sort of shared sense of purpose. So we added moving the world, something a bit more aspirational and larger. We made sure to always include the ballet school logo with moving the world so people didn't confuse us with a moving company like AMJ Campbell or some such thing. And then built out four key elements. The first was building on the legacy. This is a great old institution. Talent is the sole entry criteria, and it was very, very important for us that kids got in on the basis of talent and not their capacity to pay, and it's very important in terms of artistic development that we continue to do that. We launched a number of partnerships with digital media producers, filmmakers, photographers, and so on that could help take the content to a much larger audience. We launched a program in cultural entrepreneurship where we took young dancers and dance companies and provided mentorship to help them scale up. We also launched a very provocative new initiative called Creative Venture, where we worked with young professionals to help them help other dance organizations raise money. 
which was hard for my board to understand at the time, me pitching them on setting up a fundraising initiative that was to help other institutions fundraise, but it was pretty important. And that organization has now raised over $600,000 for small dance organizations in Toronto. It's so pretty important. We also launched a partnership with So You Think You Can Dance Canada. Um, when this show started, the ballet community was outraged because it was so crass and commercial and it became so popular, of course, that we all jumped on board. Uh, managed to register over 1,100 studios and 750,000 dance students on a platform called wanttodance.ca, which is really important in terms of scaling up our retail businesses and creating a much more profound sense of the national dance community. And then we launched a new program for public schools <clears throat> where we created a flash mob and uh, the flash mob partner was Leslie Feist and uh, Matthias Mrozewski, who is the choreographer. Matt created a piece and we were discovering that there were 350 dancers in this work from week to week. People were mislearning the dance. So he created a series of Vimeo videos so you could practice along with the dancers and choreographers from the ballet school. One of our dance participants took those videos back to her public school and taught her whole public school the flash mob which was sort of one of those aha moments where we realized that maybe our role was not creating the finished product, but rather creating the pedagogical content, whereas the National Ballet School, we could roll out Canadian choreography to Canadian music and then get every, hopefully every public school in the country participating. Last year they had about 40,000 kids participate in uh, uh, flash mobs produced in Toronto. The BAMP Center, so this is a great institution. The good news for me, no financial problems when I started, so it's, uh, it's all upside, which is pretty exciting. Although the bitumen bubble has created a few issues for us, but anyhow, we'll leave that aside for today. Just trying to explain where the BAMP Center fits in. So the BAMP Center is the world's largest arts and creativity incubator. There's nothing as big or as diverse anywhere on Earth. We have 4,000 artists who come through the center every year to develop new works of art. Um, so where we fit into the overall performing arts ecology is at the base of this pyramid, we've got hopefully community arts and public school arts education so that everyone has access. Of course, we know that's not the case and we want to do some things to try to address that. If everyone could move through that layer, they become creative citizens. These are the people that Richard Florida will tell us we are trying to attract and retain. Some of those people, most of those people, go off to become engineers and actuaries and dentists and whatever else. A few people disappoint their parents severely by deciding to become professional artists. <clears throat> and we go into either one of the 36 national arts training institutions or the 140 universities and colleges in Canada. Um, arguably, maybe too many of these and certainly not coordinated enough. But again, let's pretend that was working fine. They become professional artists. Once you become a professional artist, you really don't know what's going to happen next. And it gets very, when you get to the end of one of these programs, I'm speaking from personal experience here, you get very nervous because you realize the program's ending and you're not sure what will happen next. So you wait for one of two things, well, three things. One, hopefully, some very wealthy person discovers you and pays for your bills for the rest of your life. That doesn't tend to happen very often, but that would be nice. Number two is you wait for the mysterious Arts Council grant. So you apply, and you wait, and you usually don't get it, and then you wait a few more years, and then finally you do, and it's $5,000. Which, when you're 17, sounds like a lot of money. When you're 25 and washed up, you realize it's not a lot of money. So. Not a lot, not enough seed investment here, which is important. The BAMP Center is an incubator. So what we do is we take professional artists and we give them opportunities to play across disciplines, ideally to play with film, media, digital technologies and new business models, and then help them launch regionally, nationally and internationally. I use this slide in a couple of ways. One is, you know, as we're looking at building out arts leadership programs at the BAMP Center, to look at studying the various levels of the ecology, but also what tends to happen in not-for-profits and arts organizations is we run out of money, or we're short of money, so we diversify into other parts of this sort of system. And so the center, for example, was also into regional presenting, which means traveling roadshows, just dropping in at the BAM Center, and arts training, and really what we should be focusing on exclusively is that piece, which is what we're sort of doing now. So how are we going to get the message of the BAM Center out there? I can see some of the uh, 
PowerPoint reformatting has lost a few words there, so there should be a D at the end of that one, as you can probably tell. So area one for us is around access. <clears throat> So what we're doing there is making sure that the stories, so you, some of those of you that have been to the BAM Center, sometimes we have the sort of the, some of the top artists, lecturers from anywhere in the world, and we'll have audiences of 80 or 90 people or sometimes 20 people. So we want to get those stories out there, and we're doing that through four different strategies. The first is we're launching three radio stations over the next year, an English, French, and a full commercial broadcast license. Uh, we'll be doing, I think, a comparable amount of recording as CBC does in Canada. So this is not a small play into radio, but a very large play. And the person who ran CBC Radio 2 is our new senior producer of audio. And our new VP of Arts is the head, former head of digital media for CBC. So we're pretty excited about that. On the web content platform side, we're building out the online equivalent that TED.com has for content management. So we're going to basically be able to take all of the artistic performances, presentations, put them online to be streamed on any device anywhere in the world for free. On the TV broadcast side, we're launching our own internet protocol television channel as well as partnering with CBC and Shaw. And then on the BAM Center Press, we've hired a new managing editor to do publishing and e-publishing for literary arts, conference abstracts, and such. Area two, we're redividing our leadership development focus. One minute, oh my gosh. So we're developing leadership de new leadership development programs around indigenous, civil service renewal, design thinking, which is really the intersection between creative practice and business practice, a new arts management training program, a new approach to arts education, and social enterprise in the middle, which is basically values-based business, building a better society and such. Our partners are these. We've got the Banff International Research Station, which is 2,000 mathematicians that come to the Banff Center every year. CIFAR, the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, has just announced it's relocating its home to the Banff Center. So that's a huge deal for us in terms of connecting with Canada research chairs. Alberta Innovate's also moving to us, and we're launching a series of World Economic and Innovation Fora. Investing more in arts activity, I need about $12 million more than I have per year at this point to make sure the quality of the program is top tier. We'd like to move to a tuition-free model where artists don't pay tuition on campus. That's important to us. And on the campus side, we have plans to renew everything, rebuild all of the arts facilities, and hopefully also a very large water slide park. That was a j joke, thanks. I'm glad you caught that. There will be no water slide park. I was just being sarcastic. Um, last slide, so what we've done with our strategic vision is we've shared it and developed it with all 530 staff of the BAMP Center. We're now sharing it with key stakeholders and partners and certainly would welcome any of you who have ideas and want to make a contribution to the artistic community to connect with us. So I will leave it with that, but I will also encourage you in Calgary, you have got, again, a supportive mayor, a supportive council, a really collaborative arts community, a very unusually collaborative arts community, a lot of pioneering energy. So just really make the most of that and seize the day. Thank you very much. Questions? Questions? Oh, questions.